in this medical apps master class we are going to learn about esophageal disorders now when i talk about esophageal disorder these are six seven very short topics and definitely one or two questions in seen in every examination because they form a part of pathology or they form a part of surgery and even clinical cases which as a part of medicine paper can be given so these are very short topics each not more than 3 4 minutes and if you have learned it you will be very easily able to solve the questions so the first topic of discussion is zenker's diverticulum and for to understand the pathogenesis of zenker's diverticulum i will have to show you the anatomy also so let's look at the anatomy of the oropharynx and the upper end of the esophagus so this muscle if you see this muscle if you see this is thyropharyngeus muscle and you can see the direction of the fibers this muscle if you see this is the upper end of the esophagus and this is the longitudinal muscle of your esophagus okay and this if you can see this is your cricopharyngeus so these are the three muscles which form the upper end of the esophagus and the you know um, oropharynx now if you can see in the diagram itself it's very evident that there are certain areas which are not covered by this muscles and these forms an area of weakness now this upper triangle which you can see it is called as chilean triangle and this lower triangle which you can see this is called as limus triangle there are two small areas of you know where the muscle does not cover that is called as chilean jamsons triangle so these are the potential area of weakness now what will happen with age when the muscles weak become weak these potential from these potential areas of weakness because of the pressure from the food there can be divert, uh, you know formation of diverticulum okay so this is the pathogenesis so these are potential areas of weakness and with age what will happen is you know uh, because uh, with age the muscles will become weaker and these potential areas of weakness can develop diverticulum so this is zenker's diverticulum so how will the patient present with so this patient will be a geriatric patient as i told you you know those potential weaknesses are accentuated with the weakening of the muscles muscles you know which are forming that area okay so clinical features it will be a geriatric patient and that patient will primarily present with non uh, you know dysphagia okay so a geriatric patient presenting with dysphagia now whenever a geriatric patient comes with dysphagia you know you may start thinking in terms of esophageal cancer which is like very common so here the difference between a esophageal cancer patient and uh, this patient will be this patient will have relatively non progressive dysphagia whereas in a ca esophagus patient the dysphagia will be you know progressive if you take a proper history they can also talk about halitosis because you know food will be impacted in that uh, you know uh, impacted so there will be halitosis okay and then also with, along with halitosis you can have regurgitation of yesterday's food item all that food may enter into the diverticulum and uh, you know there can be regurgitated so yesterday food items regurgitation again that's very you know uh, history which you can elicitate so these are the you know how a patient will present remember the age group remember dysphagia remember halitosis regurgitation of yesterday's food item how do you diagnose it? it's relatively simple so you go for a barium sallow and when you do a barium sallow you can see in this diagram very easy to identify this diverticulum okay so this is your zenker's diverticulum it's a surgical you know the management is surgic uh, you know surgical where you go for a diverticulum so you cut out the uh, diverticulum so this is all about zenker's diverticulum which you have to remember obviously a little more you can learn in terms of surgery or in pathology but from medicine point of view that is more important the next topic is diffuse esophageal spasm so what happens here how will a patient of diffuse esophageal spasm present to you so here the patient will be relatively young but he will have chest pain so he may present to you in a cardiology opd and this chest pain this angina will be at rest okay and when you get this patient worked up of various cardiac parameters like you know ecg stress echo you know troponin all will be negative but he is having very you know you know very uh, typically very you know heavy chest pain he is having so this is why we call it as an esophageal angina so what happens here here what happens is the you know there is the you know pressure in the esophagus is very very high okay esophageal pressure is very very high now we know that our blood pressure is 120 80 so imagine if the pressure of the esophagus which is normally 25 mm of hg rises more than 120 so what will happen you know the pressure of the esophagus will lead to the you know 
pressing of the blood vessels in the esophagus because the you know the blood vessel pressure is 120 and if the pressure in the esophagus is more than 120 then what will happen there will be a pressing of blood vessels and these pressing of blood vessels will lead to angina so that is why it is called as esophageal angina also you can have a history of non-progressive dysphagia and what is the cause of diffuse esophageal spasm also called as des so it is mostly idiopathic so most common causes idiopathic which means there is no clear cut cause for a diffuse esophageal spasm how do we diagnose it as i told you that you know the primary pathology is increase in the pressure of the esophagus so you we will go for an esophageal manometry and to establish a diagnosis uh, we should you know show 120 mm of sg more than 120 millimeter, uh, millimeter of sg for more than 3 seconds and as i told you because this is our arterial pressure so if the pressure of the esophagus becomes more than that it will start crushing the blood vessels and that is why it will cause us angina another condition associated with diffuse esophageal spasm when the pressure is much more higher for a longer duration for example when the pressure is more than 180 mm of hg for more than 6.5 seconds then that you call as nutcracker esophagus another i mean you can give be given a radiograph for that that is we can get a barium so solo done for it and what you will find you can have a classical corkscrew appearance on radium shallow so this is a corkscrew appearance or you can have a rosary bead rosary bead appearance okay so these are the two uh, you know images they can give you as a part of barium solo which will establish a diagnosis of both diffuse esophageal spasm as well as nutcracker esophagus the primary uh, you know uh, you know difference between both these conditions is the amount of pressure increase and for the duration how do we manage it now remember here even when you are trying to tell the patient that he does not have any cardiac pathology but because the chest pain is so huge he will be under a lot of anxiety and anxiety actually increases this esophageal spasm so anxiolytics we can use we will also use nitrates especially the long acting ones like isosorbite uh, mononitrate and we can also use calcium channel blockers like amlodipine so this is the management of your diffuse esophageal spasm let's move and discuss about echolasia cardia again this is a uh, uh, this is a pathology of the tone here what happens rather than the entire esophagus the lower esophageal tone is basically increased okay in this condition in diffuse esophageal spasm we have seen that the entire esophagus the tone was increased here only the lower esophageal sphincter you know uh, you know uh, tone will be increased let's look at the causes and then we will see what happens so the most common cause is idiopathic but there are two very important causes which are asked as a part of examination one is oat cell uh, carcinoma of lung and second is Kaga's disease now we know that Kaga's disease what happens there is a destruction of the uh, you know inhibitory ganglia okay and red book bug is the uh, agent for Kaga's disease it's a uh, uh, yeah. so these are the three important causes remember oat cell carcinoma uh, oat cell carcinoma of lung there are so many paraneoplastic syndrome you have to learn about them uh, separately but these are the important causes so what will be the uh, pathogenesis basically there are two pathogenic mechanism first is the pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter is increased so nothing can it's not easy for food to come from esophagus to stomach and second is there is decrease peristalsis in your esophagus itself so both of these you know uh, will be very important contributory in pathogenesis of this so there is a peristalsis and there is increased lower esophageal uh, you know tone so how will a patient present so these are relatively young patients it's more common in females so you can have a, a 25 to 35 year old female and c will complain of progressive dysphagia so here you will have a progressive dysphagia but here the age group is you know much younger okay the second thing is that the you know dysphagia will be more in in uh, two liquids as compared to solid now many patients may not tell it but some patients may tell you that the dysphagia, dysphagia is more to liquid as compared to solid now there are two reasons for this number one remember solid food you know can you know press you know put pressure on the wall of the esophagus and generate some amount of peristalsis which is not there in case of liquid food and second thing is solid foods are generally heavier so they will put pressure on the lower esophageal sphincter and open it so that is why the dysphagia is more towards liquid as compared to solid and the patient will typically complain that when he eats food the food sticks behind his sternum so that is what he will say along with that you can have because there is food which is going to stay in the you know 
um, the, the esophageal emptying is not proper. You can have halitosis, you can have regurgitations, and because of this regurgitation, the patient may give a you know a history of recurrent pneumonia. So this is how a patient will present. How do you diagnose it again? Because the problem is in uh, the esophageal pressure. So esophageal manometry becomes the uh, diagnostic, uh, you know, modality of choice, investigation of choice. And here you will find lower esophageal tone being increased. Another very, you know, uh, important point here is definitely in the exam, sometimes they ask about a condition where lower esophageal expenditure pressure is decreased. Okay, they can give you a clinical history of this phase and everything, but in that they will give you a clinical history, uh, you know, uh, finding where lower esophageal expenditure is tone is decreased. So this happens in your scleroderma. Remember this important point. In a scleroderma, the lower esophageal expenditure is because scleroderma also presents with dysphagia in relatively young females. Okay, so this is a very important differential diagnosis. The second investigation we can do is a barium uh, swallow. Here we will have a bird beak appearance. Remember, uh, here you can see there is a absolutely you know tightening of the lower esophageal expenditure. So this is bird beak appearance. When we talk about um, uh, CA uh, carcinoma esophagus, remember there also there will be tin, but there will be irregular filling because of the mass of the carcinoma. There will be irregular filling here. The filling is very very regular. So I'll show you some manometrics, uh, you know, barium cello slides on which you can have. Another very important question they can ask you is barium enema, bird beak appearance. What where do we show? see? So it is sigmoid valvular. So both are very important valvular. So how do we manage it? So basically it's a surgical management. Either you can uh, go for a laparoscopic error myotomy where you cut the muscle so that it relaxes with fund application. So this is again a surgery part of it. Suppose the patient is not fit for surgery or patient refuses for surgery, then you can give you know botulinum toxin or you can go for a balloon dilatation or calcium channel blockers if the patient is not able to you know not uh, agree to do anything. So this is echolasia cardia. The third condition which we are going to uh, you know discuss is GERD. Now GERD is also called as uh, you know non ulcer dyspepsia. Now here the condition is reversed. Here what happens is that the lower esophageal expenditure becomes more lax. Okay, so whenever the food is whatever the food is accumulated in your stomach, it will be regurgitated. Okay, so the how the patient will present the patient will present with chest pain, the patient will present with heartburn and uh, you know retrosternal pain. Also, because you know uh, this regurgitation, all this acid because esophagus does not have you know there is almost zero amount of acid in esophagus. So esophageal you know uh, uh, you know wall is not able to they are not having any protective mechanism against the acid remember so that is why and many times these you know acid may come to the sore throat so you can have a patient complaining of multiple episodes of sore throat also when the patient lies down then the regurgitation may increase so you can have a you know patient talking about nocturnal cough because of the chemical tracheitis and remember nocturnal cut, uh, cough is also seen in asthma but you will also have post nasal drip and you know as the differential diagnosis of a nocturnal cup. You can also have sour brush, okay, and because this acid, if it comes to mouth, it can damage your dental enamel, okay. So enamel hypoplasia can also happen. So these are how clinically the patient will present. Obviously, the problem is in pH, so you will monitor the esophageal pH, okay, and if the pH is less than 4 for 4 hours per day, then your, you know, uh, diagnosis of GERD is established. Remember, because normally the pH, uh, you know, uh, it's not acidic in your esophagus. Okay, how do we manage it? Obviously, we will use our EPIs and certain prokinetic drugs. What does this prokinetic drugs do? They will ensure faster, you know, offloading of stomach content into your small intestine. And agents like mozapride, etopride are generally used for your uh, GERD or non-ulcer dysplasia. The next condition we are going to talk about is Barrett's esophagus. Now, Barrett's esophagus is basically a, a pre-malignant condition, and here the patient presenting feature will be dysplasia. And the, what is the uh, so? It's a pre-malignant condition where there is a metaplasia. So the squamous epithelium of the esophagus is converted into columnar. You can you will find globulate cells. Okay. Now, globulate cells are typically seen in the small intestine. But in this case, your stomach is going to show globulate cells. So uh, there is a metaplasia from squamous to columnar, and the patient may have symptoms of dysphagia. It's a carcinoma in situ, and why it is very important because 
you know to establish a diagnosis you will do an upper gi endoscopy with a punch biopsy and if you see globulate cells uh, the management is basically resection and stomach mobilization so again this is very very important a very uh, frequently asked question is what is the most common type of metaplasia now the answer is very simple if you know one of the most common can uh, uh, you know cancers is uh, lung cancer because of smoking so that makes columnar to squamous here it is reverse squamous to columnar so columnar to squamous is the most common metaplasia so this completes our uh, barrett's esophagus yes you can learn a lot more about it in from pathology but primarily this is what uh, you know questions is going to be asked on the next is bore half syndrome now what is bore half syndrome it's basically esophageal tear of lower one third okay now remember upper one third esophageal tear okay or upper part of esophageal tear is primarily due to instrumentation remember but here we are talking about a lower one third esophageal tear so what will happen how will it present so it will present as you know a patient who is like alcoholic and he has been binge drinking and suddenly he has a retching episode with acute chest pain and he, a episode of painting and because there is a uh, you know tear through and through tear of esophageal you know esophagus what will happen the content of the esophagus will come into the mediastinum and there will be chemical mediastinum uh, medi uh, mediastinum infection okay inflammation and this is what will you know uh, uh, what we call this is what will present as chest pain or you know even in syncope so you can have pneumomediastinum mediastinum is a typical triad macular's triad and what is that macular's triad which is seen in bowel halves is chest pain with vomiting and subcutaneous emphysema because of this chemical mediat uh, mediastinus so what you do you can go for an x-ray and x-ray a typical is you know continuous diaphragm sign okay continuous diaphragm sign so this is typically and you can see on the lung you can have air shadow so these are the two signs to show that there is a uh, uh, chemical mediastinus and a probable esophageal tear but you will have to establish the esophageal tear uh, because the management is surgical so you the investigation of choices just ct with contrast now we are not going to give a perium contrast we are going to give a water soluble contrast in this case but again investigation of choice remember and this question has been asked is just a ct with your water soluble contrast and how do you manage it you basically manage it by surgical repair obviously when the patient presents here we will have low bp there are so many other markers you know high pulse rate that you can you know uh, get to, to the diagnosis of bore half syndrome it's an emergency the patient has to be operated you know under emergency the next condition which we are going to talk about is bocard triad now bocard triad what is a bocard triad so this has three features one is epigastric pain second is nausea but no vomiting remember here the patient is having a lot of nausea but he is not able to vomit in fact he will keep telling that if i vomit i will start feeling better and third is failure to pass nasogastric pain a completely normal patient is having epigastric pain and suddenly you know uh, he is having nausea but no vomiting and if you want to pass a epigastric uh, nasogastric tube you are not able to so where it is seen it is seen in your gastric valvulus now gastric valvulus are not very common they are uncommon and they can happen in children primarily children who have congenital diaphragmatic defects if they can even happen in adult but rarely before 50 after 50 they can happen and uh, again the most common cause is basically di uh, diaphragmatic defects or weakness in the diaphragm okay so what are the two different types of uh, gastric valvulus obviously it's a purely surgical topic you will learn more about it but these patients will come to your you know uh, medical emergency so you will have to identify these and then send to your surgical counterparts so one is organo axial so here if you draw a line like this so here the valvulus is around this line and the second is mesentro axis if you draw draw line here so the valvulus is uh, is around this axis okay so if you do a chest x-ray you can see this is organo axial so this is the folding which is happening around this axis and here you can see this is a uh, you know uh, mesentro axial and obviously there is some kind of defect here also that's why it is moving on to the mediastinum so this is yeah. again what will be the investigation of choice again the investigation of swine will be abdominal tv and probably with a barium contrast so this is your investigation choice management either you go for an endoscopic reduction or a surgical repair 
okay and remember another very few uh, one question one line about which is more common so organoaxial is more common as compared to mesentrophic axial so again you can learn about this uh, in complete detail so these were the important uh, you know uh, disorders of esophagus very short topic but you will uh, see generally one or two questions coming from this topic it is very short topic